Hello, welcome to the Wisconsin Conservation Hall of Fame induction ceremony honoring Michael Dombeck, Mike to most of us. I'm Patty Dreyer. I'm immediate past president of the Wisconsin Conservation Hall of Fame Foundation and I'll be your MC today. We have pre-recorded some parts of this event, but we'll host a live interview with our inductee as a special feature. I'm located in Stevens Point, the heart of Wisconsin at Schmeekley Reserve Visitor Center on the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point campus. We are pleased, so pleased to have you join us today and are grateful for the technology that brings us together. After this induction ceremony today, I think you will be awed at the impact of Mike Dombeck, how he took lessons learned in rural Wisconsin to the national scene and back home again to teach and mentor others. How he forged partnerships, crafted policies, and influenced others, all while keeping in mind his core values in challenging settings and situations to positively affect the stewardship of over 500 million acres of public lands. But before we delve deeper into his story, Let's thank our event sponsors today. At the double platinum level, we have Helen Johnson Liebold and Craig Liebold. We have platinum sponsors, Trout Unlimited, United States Forest Service and the Department of Agriculture, the David H. Smith Conservation Research Fellowship Program, otherwise known as the Smith Fellows. And the silver sponsors include the Aldo Leopold Foundation, Ice Age Trail Alliance, Joanne M. and Richard C. Hemp, Stephen Bourne, Madison Audubon, Friends of Ducks Unlimited in Wisconsin, Tim and Linda Isley, Kathleen Falk and Peter Bach, the Columbia Marquette Chapter of Pheasants Forever, Inc. in Wisconsin, and now Brown sponsors include Peter McKeever, Dork County Land Trust, Todd Ames, Paul DeLong, Wisconsin Society for Ornithology, Brent Hagland, Tom and Mary John Hauge, Wisconsin Wildlife Federation, and the Society of American Foresters. In-kind contributions come from the U University of Wisconsin, Stevens Point. Let me share how this event will flow. We'll feature three wonderful speakers sharing highlights of Mike's life and career in two presentations. We will present Mike with an official recognition 
from the Wisconsin Conservation Hall of Fame and an official legislative citation from the state of Wisconsin. Then I'll conduct a live interview with him. This will be your chance to hear Mike share some of his story and some thoughts for our next generation of conservationists. We will close the event with Mike's video montage from the opening of the ceremony. We knew you'd want to watch it again. We will also turn on the live chat feature so attendees at this induction ceremony today may share thoughts, memories, and gratitude with Mike. This is our way to host a reception line for him so that you can offer your personal congratulations. We'll record those thoughts for you and send them in a written package to Mike so he won't miss any of them. Are you ready? Let's get started by sharing some background on the Wisconsin Conservation Hall of Fame and the induction process. The Wisconsin Conservation Hall of Fame Foundation was created in 1984 to encourage the growth and practice of a conservation ethic as a legacy for the people of Wisconsin. The Wisconsin Conservation Hall of Fame is a nonprofit organization guided by a board of directors. Voting member organizations represent more than 30 conservation organizations from around Wisconsin. Each year, the Wisconsin Conservation Hall of Fame inducts up to three people into the Hall of Fame. To date, there are over 100 inductees who have been honored. You can learn about each of these conservation champions on the Wisconsin Conservation Hall of Fame website or by visiting the Hall of Fame Gallery. The Wisconsin Conservation Hall of Fame Gallery of Inductees is located in beautiful Schmeekley Reserve which is a natural area on the campus of the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point with five miles of nature trails and wildlife viewing opportunities. Inside the Schmeekley Reserve Visitor Center, guests can view engraved wooden plaques about inductees with quotes highlighting their contributions. A touchscreen computer gives visitors a chance to connect with Wisconsin's conservation heritage as they browse the stories and learn about the achievements of each inductee. Any person or organization can nominate someone for induction into the Wisconsin Conservation Hall of Fame. Nominees have an array of environmental and conservation related backgrounds and varying types of education and experience. From writers to artists, from educators to policymakers, from researchers to managers, Wisconsin Conservation Hall of Fame heroes come from all backgrounds and walks of life. Based on standards and criteria set by the Wisconsin Conservation Hall of Fame Board of Directors, all inductees must have significant ties to Wisconsin and their contributions must have wide-reaching impact, affecting a range of natural resources. Each summer, a five-member Board of Governors reviews nominations. The highly esteemed governors are an independent body and have in-depth knowledge of Wisconsin's conservation history. The governors select five nominations to forward to the Board of Directors and voting member organizations for their consideration. The Board members and organization representatives select the following year's inductees from that list of finalists at their annual fall meeting. While voting membership in the Wisconsin Conservation Hall of Fame is only open to organizational members of the Foundation, individuals may participate in the mission by providing annual support as affiliate members. The financial support of member organizations and affiliate members allows the Wisconsin Conservation Hall of Fame to celebrate, advance, and share Wisconsin's conservation legacy as it hosts induction ceremonies and maintains inductee archives. We invite you to learn more about the Wisconsin Conservation Hall of Fame and Wisconsin's conservation heritage by visiting our website at wchf.org.
let me introduce you to our first speaker. This speaker is Bob Smale, a friend, mentee, and former student of Mike Dombeck, who is currently research scientist for the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources. So after Mike finished up with the Forest Service, he somehow convinced Pat and his wife to come back to Wisconsin and they settled back into Stevens Point. Um, instead of just you know, spending all of his time hunting and fishing, you know, which he still did plenty of, he, uh, he became very active in conservation within Wisconsin. He uh, served on a number of uh, uh, boards for uh, conservation nonprofits, you know, such as Trout Unlimited and the Nature Conservancy. Um, he was also a UW System Fellow that uh, lectured and promoted conservation education in the UW-Wisconsin system across the state, you know, working out of the University of Wisconsin-Stevens Point. And uh, he also served on the, all the Leopold Foundation board and was pretty integral in the capital campaign, which uh, helped to fund the, the construction of the Aldo Leopold Center in, in Baraboo, which I'm seated in right now. I've got Aldo Leopold right behind me. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so that's where he was. I, I ended up meeting Mike in 2004. I had, uh, I had gone back to school to get my master's degree and didn't have an advisor and, and basically cold called him uh, saying, you know, uh, here's, I have some ideas that I want to do. I, I had been working in the trades for a, a number of years before that. And I had zero credentials for conservation. Um, but for whatever reason, Mike decided to, you know, give me a ch chance and he, you know, gave me a couple of tasks to see if I could accomplish them, some writing samples, things like that. And, uh, ended up deciding to take a chance on me and, uh, and became my advisor through my master's program. Uh, it's kind of funny, the, 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 the first time that we really had a meeting about what my project was going to be, I had all sorts of big ideas and went over to Mike's house, you know, up on, on the you know, little Northwest on, on the Wisconsin river outside of Stevens point and went to his house and, you know, was going to really try to impress him. And, uh, he, he told me to bring my fly rod along. Uh, so we, we get there and chatted a little bit, you know, showed me around his place and, uh, introduced me to his dog and, you know, that, uh, and I, I think the only time that I ever felt any scrutiny of my skills from Mike was when he watched me tie a fly on that he had, he had given me to go out fishing. Um, but uh, so which I, I, I succeeded at, uh, which was good. So, you know, maybe at least pass that first test. Um, but, you know, so we go down to the Wisconsin River and, and hop in and uh, it was just surprised, you know, that we go down and, and Mike sits in the back, paddles me around and we fish. We, Chat, we chat about my my intentions and what my my master's thesis might be, things like that. But more so, Mike just showed me around. Like we talked, we talked, just had fun as 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 people. And uh, but interwoven in that was the the fact that you know the ideas about conservation, where we were going. There wasn't this differentiation like we're going to have a big serious conversation now about something, and now we're going to go fish. It was like all just part of being yourself. Um, which I think was one of the great things about Mike um, that he had this uh, persona that was. In, in mentoring that was not paternalistic at all. That it wasn't like, here, I'm the wise old sage, Mike Dombeck, I was Forest Service Chief, the BLM Director, I'm going to show you the, the, uh, the uh, share the wisdom that I've earned over the years. It was, it was just Mike, he was, you know, as, as likely to interrupt a conversation to, <laughs> to point out a good John Prine lyric uh, on the, that he had playing in the background or, uh, or, or hop up to grab another, another beverage. Um, but, but also at the same time, share, you know, what is, you know, really, you know, Th his very thoughtful approach to conservation and conservation policy. Um, you know, I think this is one of the, the he, Mike finished up his career working with the Smith Fellows Fund. He started there in 2005 and just retired in, in 2021, like a year and a half or, or so ago. And in this program, he mentored uh, recent doctoral uh, graduates. So people that were er early career uh, uh, pr professionals getting into the conservation profession, you know, many of them going off to uh, eventually going off to work as professors, have their own uh, students and advisees. Um, but, you know, I had, to, I had the opportunity to talk to some of the people that were involved with him in the program. And uh, I got, got to see a video from his retirement, too, which you know, had some very entertaining stories, which we'll, we'll let Mike tell you some of those on his on his own. Um, but one of the things that, you know, I, that really resonated with me having been his advisee as a, as a master's student, uh, that resonated with the, when I heard the com conversations and the anecdotes and the stories from the other students was that there are a couple of things that, that the Mike just really projected as, as a, as an advisor. Um, the one, you know, to have fun, that, that this is the, the it's serious business and conservation and sustainability and, you know, uh, protecting our resources for use into the future and protecting wild places and protecting natural areas. This is all incredibly important, maybe the most important thing we can be doing, but if we're not having fun doing it, what's the point that you need to have fun. 
um, that one of the other things that uh, he, he noted too was the risk taking. You know, he encouraged me when I went back to get my master's degree. I had zero ambition to to go on to academia. I figured I'd go, go get a job with the DNR, you know, where I am now. But um, he encouraged me to start a PhD, which I had no idea. I was a first gen college kid. I had nothing, had no interest in academia. Um, eventually, I finished that up, and the the risks paid off. And that's one of the things that he really stressed with the the Smith fellows was to take risks. That if you're if, that you're you're not going to achieve the things that you want unless you take some chances. And I think that this can be done on a personal level or on a policy level. You look at you know you look at the Roldis rule that he, that he helped to get passed um, was was an, an incredible risk. You know he he got a great deal of scrutiny from from other forestry professionals on the decision. Some people are still unhappy with with that. But but it was a risk to, to do it, and he achieved it. And thousands of acres of roadless areas, roadless areas have been protected. Um, and I think that's a really important thing for him to convey to people that are right at that stage of their career where they're just starting to take off and might be looking for security, might be looking to to to, to find some something that hold on to that is is comfortable. To instead, that it's okay to be uncomfortable. If you're not a little uncomfortable, then you're probably not going to make progress. Um, and then one of the other things that I think was was just no, notable, you know, again, Mike Mike's list of accomplishments are are, are pretty long. Um, but one of the one of the Smith fellows said that Mike has a great accomplishment to ego ratio. That he's done all these things, but there's no ego about it. But at the same time, it's he's proud of them, and it's clear that he's proud of them. It's clear that he's proud of the things that he's done that he's been able to achieve. But there's no ego. He doesn't think that that you know makes him better or has given him any advantages. That in in that presence that you know will just convey that you can be proud without being uh egotistical about it you can't you can you can be uh respectful of your own accomplishments while not portraying a condescension to anybody else um and that his role in the in the smith fellows program i you know you you look at all of the accomplishments that he's had that he, there's a multiplier factor that will come about from his mentorship of, of these students over the years. Um, one of the things that really sticks with me that, that Mike has said that, you know, asking him as, you know, the, the, the stress and dealing and uh, dealing with being a forest service chief or you know, with being BLM director, that ask him how he dealt with, you know, some of those high stressful situations. And he said that the, the most difficult part of those jobs um, and the part that I, I believe that you really excelled at when you listen to his colleagues and when you listen to his mentors is that he saw his job mainly as putting people in places to succeed, that he didn't need to be the one doing the, the job. He needed to, find, to, to take his staff, who were all you know, energetic and talented people, and find out, figure out which tasks they could do and they could succeed at, and putting them in position, making sure they had their tools, and as Micah said, and then get out of their way. And and I think that, that that's one of the gr greatest strengths that, 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 that he had as a conservation leader. Um, and then you start to think about that with his, you know, saying putting people in, in positions to succeed. And you think about his, a picture starts to form if you if you think about him as a, as a young fishing guide in his teens. Um, and then as a, you know, as a, 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 a conservation professional working for the Forest Service and then in leadership positions in the Bureau of Land Management and, and with the Forest Service. And then as his role as a mentor in, with the Smith Fellows, you start to see this picture comes together of, of Mike just putting people in places where they have the opportunity to succeed, whether this person was a, a, a client who he was trying to get them to catch, you know, catch their first muskie, or it was a, an employee at the Forest Service, or whether it was one of the Smith fellows, that there's this repeated need to, the, the repeated challenge to identify what are the skills and the interest of the person that I'm trying to, to, to help. And, and then to read the waters, you know, either literally, you know, reading the waters for, for fishing or reading the political waters or reading the academic waters to figure out how can we match this person's skills and interests with the situation and give them a chance to succeed. And, you know, while his achievements are, are really hard to overstate, you know, some of the, the, the this, this is, his, his resume of, of, of conservation accomplishments is, is quite long. But I think he probably played a bigger role in having an impact on the conservation profession that, you know, Mike has said that conservation is nothing if not about choices, but choices left for those future generations. And I think importantly, Mike is helping to ensure that the conservation professionals working in those future generations will have the tools available to make those choices. 
Um, I, it's an honor that I was asked to to, to uh, give a talk to induct Mike. Uh, he, he's a great friend and uh, has been a great mentee, and I would even say colleague at some times. And uh, and I think Wisconsin should be quite proud to have him as one of their conservation uh, as a member of the Conservation Hall of Fame. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Now I'd like to introduce our second presentation. We have two speakers for this one who will share stories of Mike Dombeck together. <laughs> Leslie Weldon, Mike's friend, mentee, and former employee. She's a 40-year veteran of the U.S. Forest Service, and Mike was her boss twice in her career. And Chris Wood. Chris is Mike's friend and mentee, who is president and CEO of Trout Unlimited and former colleague of Mike's in both the U.S. Bureau of Land Management and the U.S. Forest Service. Hi, I'm Leslie Weldon and I'm Chris Wood. We're really glad to be celebrating Mike Dombeck's induction into the Wisconsin Conservation of Hall of Fame. Congratulations, Mike. Congratulations, Mike. We're here to make fun of you in front of this <laughs> huge audience today. Right. See, when, when is it that you first met Mike? I met Mike in 1986 or 1987. I was serving as a fisheries biologist on the Mount Baker Snoqualmie National Forest and was recruited into a position as assistant fisheries program manager here in Washington, D.C. We're actually next door to um, the hall in Roslyn where we all were. So Mike was my boss as he served as the National Fisheries Program Manager and I tell this to everyone, um, best boss ever. It was during that time that the Forest Service was really coming to terms with its whole role, you know, beyond our timber production and road building, to really put a focus on our aquatic resources. So Mike spearheaded an initiative called Rise to the Future, which really turned our attention to the value, um, the science, and the need for us to protect aquatic and watershed resources. And it ended up being a huge partnership with our um, friends in recreational and sport fishing, with all of our conservation organizations, and across the agency to turn our attention to all of the value that our national forest lands for our rivers, lakes, streams that protect our fisheries resources and provide incredible recreation opportunities. So it was amazing to see that partnership and that program unfold and 30 plus uh, years later, it's still going strong. It's still going strong. I can testify to that because Trout Unlimited is a signatory to the amended Rise to the Future Agreement. Yes, and um, I think it's incredibly important to highlight what it takes as a leader to stay focused on something that's really important and know that it endures for the future. So I credit Mike with um, starting a movement around the uh, public-private partnerships and the involvement of you know the people who care about this lands and how we take care of them. Yeah, here, here. Yeah. You know, another another great example of Mike's stick to itiveness was the roadless rule. Absolutely. Um, just to set the stage for that, for those of you who aren't familiar with it. This is back 20 some odd years ago, 25 years ago. Yeah. The Forest Service had about an eight and a half billion dollar backlog on maintenance on its existing road system. Mm -hmm. And the Congress came within a single vote of eliminating the agency's entire roads budget. And the reason they were doing that, um, it was a surrogate to get the agency to stop building roads into these backcountry wilderness quality areas, these so-called roadless areas. And so Mike um, saw the problem, addressed it head on. He started first by putting a, a moratorium on all new road construction. I don't know if you remember that. I do. And it was wildly controversial. And you know, Mike is one of the most humble, mild-mannered, um, avoids controversy at every turn if he can. Um, and as you said, just one of the finest people I've ever worked with. Mm -hmm. But this was incredibly controversial, even the moratorium. And, I remember Mike would say, um, you know, the first rule of holes is to put the shovel down when you find yourself in over your head. And the Forest Service was over its head. So we, we stopped road construction for 18 months and then developed a long-term road policy. And in the context of doing that, uh, you know, Mike had the insight that, you know, it's one thing to manage your road system properly, but it's another to recognize that the values that most Americans care about for their national forests are wildness, wilderness, clean water, naturalness. Outdoor experiences. Outdoor experiences, and, and most people don't care about forage or even the small amount of wood fiber that comes from the forest, even though it's super important for those local communities. 
But what they do care about are those backcountry areas, which, you know, we're not making anymore. Yeah, yeah, and so Mike had the wisdom and, and, you know, in spite of the tremendous controversy to basically come up with a policy that 22 years later mm -hmm. is still in effect. Time, yeah. Yeah. All the challenges. All the litigation yes. and, uh, and, you know, all the slings and arrows of people who were really opposed to that. But, you know, I think it was a, it was a signal moment for the Forest Service where, you know, Mike, you had the wisdom to realize that the agency to be a conservation leader was something more than a slogan. You actually yes. had to lead. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the things I admire most about Mike is he continues that leadership today. today. You right. know, I mean, he, he and I published an op-ed recently uh, trying to convince the administration, the Forest Service, to, to, to basically stop cutting old growth. Okay. And, you know, Mike is, you know, he's incredibly mild and calm, but he's not afraid to stick his neck out. And uh, he's been a mentor and a friend for me for, for all these years. Same here, and uh, the example of the conservation leadership is incredible. You know, I, Mike influenced me, you know, and gave me courage in lots of ways through my Forest Service career. You know, again, starting, you know, as a, a fisheries biologist on a ranger district and for, very fortunately moving into some very significant leadership positions throughout my career. And uh, the ability to really take advantage of what it means to be in those positions of in, influence and the role that you can have, um, especially from the personal standpoint of you know, growing that sense of confidence and care. Mike is a person, even with his, uh, his uh, fortitude in the face of challenge to do the right thing from a conservation standpoint, always cares about people, yeah. um, about their success, their progress, uh, the care about um, providing guidance and insights. And that's been something that Mike's provided for me and many others throughout my entire career. So there's a lot to celebrate about you, about your legacy, um, true legacy as far as keeping wild places wild, which is one of the things I know is incredibly important to Mike and all of this conservation leadership, but also the fact that it takes great people, you know, to support one another and to really chart a path to the future to, our, to do our very best work in conservation wherever we're at. Here, here, another, you know, we'd be remiss not to mention, even though you and I didn't directly experience this, Mike used to have me talk to the Smith Fellows. Okay, he was exactly. part of the Smith Fellow mm -hmm. program up until recently. And, uh, you know, Mike would have the best, uh, the smartest uh, postdocs, you know, in the country come into D.C. for a policy session, and I would usually get up and talk to him. And I, I always marveled at the fact that, you know, Mike never, you never took your eye off the ball when it, when it, about realizing that conservation is about making the world a better place for the people we know are, are going to come after us. Exactly. And it's, it's such yes. a hugely optimistic and affirmative outlook that Mike mm -hmm. has mm -hmm. on life and that he brings to conservation. And, Training that next generation of conservation stewards was just another example of his tremendous. Yeah, I, tremendous I agree with you on that. You know, the mastery I think that that Mike has around engaging with, um, you know, the political side, mm -hmm. with the with the conservation um, uh, NGO side, and, and with our with the employees that he's working with is something that is uh, textbook on how to make sure that the impact of our research of our, our programs. Have, have the, the you know deliver the benefits that they're supposed to for people and for the lands and waters that we're protecting. Yeah, so that's right. There's, you know, we could go on and on. Um, what, what, we would be remiss though not to at least tell a fishing story. Okay, let's tell a fishing so, story. So I've got a good one. Okay. This is one Mike probably doesn't want to be told. So <laughs> I think I thought it must I, be told. <laughs> I just thought of this. So the shad run yes. up the Potomac. Mm -hmm. they, they're in right now and. Uh, there was, and you know, Mike was a guide, the fishing guide for 11 years, and you know, purports to be an expert angler. In fact, he is a quite accomplished angler. But we, one day, he said, "Well, let's fish for shad in the Potomac." And so, <clears throat> I was assigned the job of getting the licenses for us because you have to have a license to fish in DC. Mm -hmm. And I went to every. This is before the internet. You could okay. buy licenses yeah. we're that, online. We're that yeah, we're that old. Yeah, <laughs> and. Um, I said, Mike, I, the, 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 were, the DC hadn't printed their licenses yet, so there were literally no licenses. And so Mike and I were walking up the banks of the Potomac River at seven in the morning, casting, and coming down the other side of the river were two uniformed DC police Hello. checking licenses. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, the New Jersey in me wanted to turn around and run but given that I was working for Mike, I knew that probably wouldn't be a good idea. And of course, Mike befriended the two 
uh, officers, we were walking down the banks and they let us go on our merry way. They never even knew that we didn't have licenses. But I have evidence that Mike Dombeck fished illegally one time. But he had the intent. I was told it's not and illegal. it was your fault. It, it, I was actually told it was not illegal because DC hadn't actually printed the licenses. That's great. Yeah. Well, um, just to say, uh, you know, for Mike, we're so proud of you. Um, we wouldn't be who we are without you, you know, both with our personal lives and our professional lives. And uh, we really want to express our thanks on behalf of so many and congratulate you again on your induction to the Wisconsin Hall of Fame, what, what, Wisconsin Conservation Hall of Fame. One mark of your great accomplishments, but especially meaningful for the state and, that you love so much and the places where you really grew into your values around conservation um, that you uh, given so much to, to so many. So thank you so much for that. Here, here, Mike. Thanks for being uh, such a great boss, best boss I ever yes, had. Yes, same here. Uh, okay. Thanks for being the most important mentor I've ever had. And, same here. Uh, most <laughs> important, thanks for being uh, a great friend. All right. Congrats and enjoy and celebrate. All right. Thanks, see you, Mike. Mike. Have fun. Take care. Thank you, Leslie and Chris. On behalf of the Board of Directors, of the Wisconsin Conservation Hall of Fame Foundation, we officially recognize Michael Dombeck as being inducted into the Wisconsin Conservation Hall of Fame. The quote on the plaque to be posted on our website reads, conservation is nothing if not about choices, choices left for future generations. And that's a quote by Michael Dombeck. Congratulations, Mike. You are now a member of this exceptional group of conservation champions in our state. We will now hear remarks from State Representative Katrina Shanklin, who will share a State of Wisconsin recognition. Representative Katrina Shanklin with a citation of commendation. Know you by these presents. Whereas Michael Dombeck first developed a passion for the outdoors while growing up wandering the woods, lakes, and streams of rural Sawyer County, where he was raised in the traditions of hunting, fishing, and trapping. And whereas his love of nature led him to pursue undergraduate and master's degrees in biology and education from UW-Stevens Point and zoology from the University of Minnesota, along with a doctorate in fisheries biology from Iowa State University where he developed groundbreaking research on Wisconsin state fish, the muscalunge. And whereas, in 1978, Michael began a career in federal service as a fisheries technician with the U.S. Forest Service, eventually advancing to become a primary architect for integrating aquatic and fisheries protection and recreation policies in managing 193 million acres of national forests across the United States. And whereas, in 1989, he joined the Department of Interior, serving as science advisor and later acting director of the Bureau of Land Management, where he created a long-term vision for advancing ecosystem management, watershed protection, and watershed restoration. And whereas, Michael later returned to the United States Forest Service as chief in 1997, where he led the development of a national resource agenda focused on watershed health and restoration, recreation, and sustainable forest management. And he created a long-term forest roads policy, including the controversial roadless rule in 2001, which protected 58 million acres of the most remote national forest lands from road building and other development. And whereas, Upon returning to Wisconsin from Washington, D.C., he became a UW System Fellow and Professor of Global Conservation at UW Stevens Point from 2001 to 2010. And he served as the Executive Director of the David Smith Postdoctoral Conservation Research Fellowship Program, where he trained and mentored nearly 100 postdoctoral early career scientists in conservation. And whereas, Dr. Dombeck has authored, co-authored, and edited over 300 publications in his career, has earned numerous honors and awards for his achievements and leadership in natural resources, including the highest award in career federal service, the Presidential Rank Distinguished Executive Award, and most recently has been named a 2023 inductee into the Wisconsin Conservation Hall of Fame. Now, therefore, the members of the Wisconsin State Legislature, on the motion of Representative Katrina Shankland, to hereby honor Dr. Michael Dombeck for his outstanding service and commitment to conservation and thank him for his inspiring leadership and dedication to environmental stewardship.
Hello, everyone. Welcome to the live portion of our ceremony today on April 25th, 2023. We appreciate you being with us and want to congratulate Mike Dombeck one more time on his induction into the Wisconsin Conservation Hall of Fame. Let's welcome Mike now from the, the Aldo Leopold Legacy Center in Baraboo, Wisconsin. Hi, Mike. How are you doing, Patty? <laughs> So, wow, this is this is great. We get to have this interview, and I know a lot of folks are looking forward to it. I, I heard you talk about how your childhood growing up in the Schwamga National Forest, 25 miles from Hayward, was ideal for shaping you as a conservationist, and how your parents had owned the, the small country store, and how you worked as a fishing guide at a young age. Talk about how this all comes together to have made you who you are today. Well, I'd start off by saying I'm probably one of the luckiest people in the world. But, uh, uh, you know, uh, after uh, my parents moved from Marathon County when I was uh, about fourth grade and moved to Sawyer County in the, the Moose Lake area, which at that time was uh, sort of the end of the road, 25 miles from Hayward, a town of 1500. and um, the neighbors were guides, uh, loggers, sort of lived sort of a subsistence lifestyle. And you either fixed it yourself or didn't get fixed. Uh, that was, uh, we had just the best of friends and neighbors that took care of one another. And, and yet as a, a little kid growing up in a sort of an isolated rural community like that, with not a, a lot of exposure to other things, it was kind of interesting because you learned how to take care of yourself. And, and I was exposed to all these people as a kid when your brain is still like a sponge absorbing all of the, mm -hmm. the stories they had about the logging era and the places they had been. But then lo and behold, in the summertime, it all changed because we had this influx of tourists, of resort operators, of other people that came on vacation to want to fish and, and hunt in the beautiful lake country of northern Wisconsin. So I, I mentioned that because I got to know people, local people, not only very, very well, because the store was sort of the stopping place and the shopping place for all the local community, but in that era, the tourists as well. And uh, so we move forward to the teenage years of guiding. Um, you know, when you're in a boat with people, you get to know them very well. And you might be in a boat for a day, maybe a week. And uh, people from all walks of life, they might be farmers, they might be doctors, lawyers, business executives, uh, factory workers, and uh, listening to their stories about how they think, uh, talking about religion, about politics, about why they fish, and all of these all the places they've been. I, I gotta tell you, that's an education in itself. And just a few quick things as I reminisce, I remember fishing with a publisher of the Cleveland paper that explained to me when I was about 16 years old, how a uh, newspaper is laid out and why. And another client I had was a vice president of McDonald's Corporation. And he was telling me all about Hamburger University. Uh, in Schaumburg, Illinois, and you know how you went about getting a franchise if you wanted to go into business and have a McDonald's store. And another person I've got to mention by name, Lynn Childs, who was a dear friend, and uh, we remained friends for life in the entire family, I was the vice president of Mississippi Valley Barge Line. And one of the first days I fished with him, he explained to me how a uh, towboat captain um, moves, guides the boat up and down the Mississippi River in swift currents. So it's it's things like that that I remember. But what I've got to say is that it was an education in itself, even if I didn't realize it at the time, because it, in fact, uh, interacting with all of the people, getting to know them at a personal level, uh, listening to them for hours was an education that money couldn't buy. Awesome, awesome. And so one of the things that we like to do with the Wisconsin Conservation Hall of Fame is to help to highlight the connections between inductees. And you have shared with me that George Becker, 2010 inductee into the Wisconsin Conservation Hall of Fame was one of your mentors of your life. And could you just talk a little bit about what he taught you and how that stayed with you through your years? Uh, you know, your friends and mentors are so important. And I've got a uh, use show you this. This uh, George Becker was the author of the Fishes of Wisconsin, 
all 1,052 pages and uh, six and a half pounds. And there are species accounts of every fish in the state. And George uh, also introduced me to uh, the Sand County Almanac, which we celebrate out of Leopold and we're right here in the Leopold Legacy Center. Uh, that in a sense is, is one of the, uh, the books that whether you're a scientist or not, it's, it's good science and it's good literature and it's very, very poetic and just wonderful, wonderful reading. But um, uh, Dr. Becker was a, a very tough taskmaster, but a lot of fun. And of all of the teachers I've had, and I've had lots of good ones, he could make you work at 110% of your capability and, uh, and have fun. The enthusiasm that he had was just absolutely infectious. He was civically minded. He wanted his students to be involved in public policy to make a difference. And But I'd say the bottom line, what he did for me is he really cemented that love for fishing, the outdoors with science and the desire to make a difference. Hmm. So I'm kind of picking up some themes here, Mike, just saying. <laughs> so you shared with me that you were, when you were in your federal positions, I found this really fascinating, that you often took policymakers and member, like members of Congress or cabinet members out on fishing or on other kinds of field trips. And I really, I'm fascinated by it. And I think it's really an important thing for us to talk about. How do those shared experiences help you accomplish the desired goals you had, the outcomes you were looking for in your federal role? Well, this is a bit of carryover of uh, my guiding experience because you you do what you know how to do. And uh, so uh, taking people out on the, it might be the Shenandoah or the Potomac River, as Chris mentioned in the earlier video, um, uh, cooking them a shore lunch is a non-threatening atmosphere. I, most people enjoy being outside. Most people enjoy being on the water and doing fun things in a relaxed way. And uh, but most importantly, what that did was it built it, it built strong personal working relationships and trust. Mm -hmm. And you got to know them personally. And you know, it's a lot harder to be somebody's opponent or maybe antagonist if you know them and like them as a person. And uh, the other thing I learned from that is, is most people don't agree on a lot of things. Some people don't agree on anything, but that doesn't mean you can't have a solid, trusting, working relationship. In fact, uh, uh, of all the congressional hearings I've had and all of the contentious meetings in, in conference rooms I've had, I've got to say that if those same meetings and discussions were held out in the woods, uh, in the water, on the water, we'd uh, make a lot more progress. So mm -hmm. getting out, building trust, building personal working relationships. And I believe in their heart of hearts, most people care about the land, they care about water, they care about the future, and they wanna do the right thing. Mm -hmm. Especially for these times. We need that environment for that to happen and, and have fun doing it. Especially in these times, you know, contentious times. I think this is a really important message. Now, in your federal role, Mike, you accentuated the tie between water and forestry policies. T tell us more about that and, and the reason you did that. Well, in the uh, 1980s and 1990s, forest management, particularly in the West, was very contentious. Uh, we were still sort of in the hangover of the post-World War II timber bo harvest boom and uh, the public land management agencies, both Forest Service and BLM, were harvesting timber at an unsustainable rate, and everybody knew it. And they were doing it for a lot of reasons, uh, political pressure, economic pressures, administrative, uh, the reward system within the agency. And finally, in 1989, a federal judge stop timber harvest on 25 million acres of land. And if you think about the jobs involved and all the other things involved in that kind of a situation, finally the court system stepped in and dealt with that. Um, in come the Clinton administration and the president during camp his campaign said he would deal with this issue. Uh, the president, the vice president, four cabinet members, and I don't know how many agency heads, plus the governors of three states, Washington, California, in Oregon, 
met to solve a problem like this. And I'm thinking, you know, this is conservation. This is interesting. When has that kind of executive power uh, come together other than maybe in a time of war? But the bottom line is, it's, it seemed like everybody was mad and, and there were no solutions. Um, so we were fighting about trees, harvesting trees. And, you know, everybody loves trees. The one line are some like them horizontal and some like them vertical. But um, what about the other forest values that people care about? And of course, with my background in water, and you think about water, well, everybody has to touch water every day, whether you live in LA, Boston, Miami, uh, Chicago, Milwaukee, or Ashland, it doesn't matter. And why aren't we focusing on some of the more positive things that are out there? The hunting, the fishing, the uh, outdoor recreation opportunities, the hiking, the biking, the families going on vacations, uh, getting to know one another. Uh, why aren't we talking about this stuff more? And that really led to my focus on water because of, of course, the background I had in water. But then if you look at the, what the science tells you, one third of the US is forested. It produces two thirds of the runoff. Within the 192 million acres of national forests in the US, we've got 6,400 municipal watersheds that provide drinking water directly to 60 million people. In many cases, the water is so pure, they don't even require uh, water filtration plants. Why aren't we talking about this stuff more? So we put together a task force of people to take a look at economic values and found that the runoff just from national forest is, with a very conservative estimate, worth well over $3 billion a year. And, and that piece of data alone really exceeds far by far anything else that come off of national forest lands and everybody should care about water. And it's even more critical today than it was 25 years ago. Absolutely, wow. So um, Mike, I, I, through this process of working with you, I learned that you are one of nine conservationists featured in Michael Freidenberg's book, it's called Intelligent Courage. And um, in this book, you say, it's a really interesting book. In this book, you say, in government, either you keep them busy or they'll keep you busy. Talk about that, please. Well, um, my boss was a uh, Secretary of Agriculture, Dan Glickman, who was prior prior to his being appointed to the uh, to the cabinet, was an 18 year uh, congressman from the state of Kansas, and uh, just a, a wonderful human being to work for and with. And uh, it was a contentious time. The uh, Senate had and House both had just flipped from uh, Democrat to Republican. Uh, there was a Democrat in the White House uh, that a uh, Forest Service chief is a non-political uh, career position. So you're a, you're a public servant in that regard. And but yet I'm going to all these congressional hearings and literally getting pummeled over the uh, timber harvest issues, over grazing fees, over all these other things. And we were never really taking any solid positions. We didn't like what was being proposed. And we would sort of end up with these mealy mouth responses of, well, this is a good concept, but we don't like this detail. So at one of the, after one of the sub cabinet meetings, uh, I was sitting in, in Glickman's chief of staff's office and, and sort of complaining about, you know, I'm going to these hearings and I'm literally getting pummeled. And I said, why aren't we proposing something? Why, why don't we lay something out there? Uh, and about that time, Secretary Glickman walked in the room and he sat down and listened for a while. He didn't engage. And, and he said, Mike, he said, go back to the Forest Service and come up with some ideas and let's do something. And that was the genesis of the natural resource agenda and where the saying comes from it. When I went back and I talked to the leadership team and employees about it, and they said, oh, no, you know, we're already way too busy. We can't do that. Well, I said, you can only be so busy. We, we can either be playing offense or playing defense. Let's start playing offense. Let's propose something. And we started keeping them busy. That's, uh, uh, and, and if you look at a textbook definition of leadership, it, it, and I don't mean to sound egotistical, but it's setting the agenda. And that's exactly what we did. And it surprised a lot of people, but it made all the difference in the world. Made all the difference in the world. Yes, I'm, I, we know it did, Mike, for sure. So specific to your home state of Wisconsin, what are you proudest of, Mike? Well, you know, I had a, a small hand in a lot of different things. I think about um, 
uh, the transfer of the Chippewa flowage from Northern States Power Company uh, to the Forest Service, to the Wisconsin DNR, and the wonderful campsites on the islands and the Chippewa flowage. If you haven't experienced them, you should, uh, with the uh, involvement of the Lacoudere tribe and providing a generation, a power generation at the dam of the Chippewa flowage uh, revenue for that and, and provide them finally, the tribe finally having a major say in what's going on in the Chippewa flowage. I think about the reintroduction of elk to Wisconsin, uh, a variety of things like that. I think about uh, a forest lodge, which uh, was featured in the uh, the video montage that you put together, but uh, it's a it's 852 acres along the shores of Lake Namakagan, and and one of the larger tracts of old growth forest in the state that has never been touched by a saw, uh, with this beautiful estate owned by Mary Griggs Burke, and she liked the fact that I was focusing on water and watershed. Uh, she was well in age, and she called me one day uh, when I was in Washington, D.C., and we talked a little bit, and that, that ultimately, and a lot of other people doing work behind the scenes, obviously, uh, ultimately ended up in the donation of that to the Forest Service, and now it's operated in partnership with Northland College with a focus on environmental education, conservation, uh, other kinds of programs, and also a focus on uh, freshwater research. Another ripple effect. Yeah, another yeah. ripple effect. But I think the thing that maybe satisfies me the most was I um, wrote a, a little article, a 500 word article called Natural History Notes that was published in a little local magazine published in Hayward called The Visitor. And uh, the target audience was the general public to try to come up with unique ideas of uh, about plants and animals to try to pique the interest of someone and connecting them to the outdoors. And I ended up doing that for 40 years. I can't believe it was that long. Even when I had uh, high pressure jobs and was very, very busy, I just sort of kept on cranking them out. And uh, it's amazing. Uh, 40 times nine issues a year is 360 articles. Wow. Wow. And they were so lucky to continue to have your voice back home. I'm sure of it. Wow. And so, um... I wanted everybody to hear a funny story that you happened to share with me about being invited to go to your daughter's fourth grade classroom. Well, actually, this is a play off the Natural History Notes article because there I was at that time, uh, the National Fisheries Program Manager for the Forest Service, and obviously I was going to talk about fish. So, you know, I go with my slide projector and carousel in that era and armload of slides and photos about fish, and I'm I'm talking to these fourth graders and you could kind of see them pretty soon looking around like this. And well, this is boring. I wonder when this guy's gonna be quiet and leave. And, uh, but a few people were paying attention and, and there was one a fourth grader that uh, finally raised his hands and he asked me, he said, do fish have eyelids? I said, well, that's an interesting question. So we started talking about, do fish have eyelids? And uh, if not, why not? Obviously, what is the purpose of an eyelid? It's to keep your eye moist. It's to wash, the, or wipe the dust away, and fish live in the water. And then it led to, do fish sink? And we even got to the point, do fish pee? <laughs> and why? And uh, the, the uh, moral of this story is, just leave it to a fourth grader, and they'll find something interesting in almost any topic and take it from boring to interesting. And uh, actually, I got several ideas for natural history notes articles just from that time in class. <laughs> and I remember grade. that you were talking about making sure that you connected with people where they were. Yes. And so this was another basic lesson in that, which just tickles me as an environmental educator. I loved it. Yeah. Loved it. So Mike, um, we're getting to the close of this, this interview, and um, I'd like to ask you what advice you have for people who aspire to be conservationists today or tomorrow? What do you, you want to leave them with as far as your nuggets? Well, successful conservation on the ground is really all about people and working with people because it's delivered uh, through people, by people, with people, for people, and with the support of people. And it's it's blending the science uh, with the social science and what's out there. So uh, uh, number one is you're going to be working with people. And the most important thing you can do is develop good 
working relationships with people and good people skills. So it's communication skills. And, and I attribute a lot of my success, uh, which other people deserve credit for, and I'll talk about that more in a little while, but the fact that the guiding, the sitting around and listening to people in a little country store, uh, trying to understand how they feel about things, why they feel about things, to me was an education that uh, surpassed almost all others. Um, I tell people, uh, nothing is more impor important than your integrity. And I'm talking about the, the Webster definition of integrity, because if you lose that as a professional, uh, it's very, very difficult to get it back. It's trust, it's working relationships, it's working together more than anything else. Uh, another thing I would mention is I talk about meeting people where they are. Uh, talk their language. If you're in an agency, don't throw a bunch of uh, acronyms at people that they don't know what they mean. Talk their language. If you're a scientist, forget the scientific lingo and the uh, technical words and talk their language. Uh, and uh, talk about place more than concepts. A place is where somebody lives and everybody cares about where they live. It, it might be on a back 40, it might be on a creek, it might be on a city lot, but the fact is they care about their little patch of grass, they care about their creek, and they care about their 40 acres. Uh, forget the using words like ecosystem and biodiversity that are very important to science scientists, but especially if you're talking about opponents and people that uh, don't support your policies, it's important to talk about that. And lastly, I would say uh, it's so important to listen to the opposition because they demonstrate to you where the weaknesses in your debate is uh, and the way you can improve your policies and do things better, sometimes more so than your friends because your friends will cheer you on. Uh, your opponents show you where your weaknesses are and where the potholes are in the road. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mike, is there anything else that you would like to add today before we say farewell and, and finish the ceremony? Well, I've, I've got to say how uh, honored I am to uh, achieve this uh, or be recognized uh, by the Wisconsin Conservation Hall in this way. And I've got to thank, uh, you know, Bob Smale and, and Alan Haney and, and Chris Wood and uh, Leslie Weldon and the many, many uh, friends that I've had that I know had a hand in this and many others that I haven't mentioned. But um, uh, of the things that I've been recognized for, none of it was accomplished by me. Much of it was accomplished only fractionally by me or not even that, because what it is, it's really a group of people that work together for common goals, uh, that work to each other's strengths, that get things done. And it's really all of the friends, supporters, colleagues that I've worked with over the years, the teachers that deserve this award. They're really the ones who deserve it. Well, Mike, we we here in the Wisconsin Conservation Hall of Fame believe you do um, deserve this. I, I know you always wanna pass along your kudos to everyone else, but we so appreciate the ways that you have made our world a better place. And, and, and um, yeah. My, my last uh, point is, I, I couldn't have had a more supportive family, a, a, a wife, Pat, of now almost 48 years that suffered through a lot of moves and thick and thin of uh, uh, late nights and lots of travel. Uh, I couldn't have done that without her, just an amazingly supportive family. And if family and fun is uh, what makes work enjoyable, doable, and I thank Pat greatly for that. Lovely, lovely. Well, Mike, we'll say farewell to you today. And um, it has been a great pleasure and honor to work with you as we've prepared for today's ceremony. Your conservation legacy, I am sure, will continue to grow as you inspire even more people, like you've inspired me so much uh, in your conservation leadership. Take care of yourself. We'll let you get to your watch party and those that are waiting virtually for you to connect with you after the ceremony. In the meantime, I'm gonna say um, hello everybody out there. We have now enabled the chat feature and um, this will be a chance for you to connect with Mike through that um, text that you're gonna send with messages and memories for him. We will provide a transcript to Mike uh, and he won't miss anything. 
uh, about what you share during the ceremony as he um, turns his attention to some in, in the other rooms at the Aldo Leopold Center. We'll leave the chat open for about five minutes, but if you're in one of those watch parties today and you're unable to send your, your notes uh, to us today, in the next day or two, you can email us at the Wisconsin Conservation Hall of Fame website, wchf.org, and we'll go ahead and include your, your messages for him. The other thing is that there's a recording that will, will take place of this event once we're finished today, and that will become available on the Wisconsin Conservation Hall of Fame website so it can be viewed again and again to share the legacy of Mike Dombeck for ge generations to come, as well as all of our other inductees. Please invite others who weren't able to join us today, especially to um, pick up the ceremony there and watch the, 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 um, the rerun there uh, of the tributes that we've put together for Mike. If you'd like to make a donation in honor of Mike Dombeck or any other uh, inductee into the Hall of Fame, we invite you to do so at our website by clicking on the Join and Donate tab. Your donations will help us continue to share the accomplishments of Mike Dombeck and other inductees with an even wider audience as we continue our mission of celebrating, advancing, and sharing Wisconsin's conservation legacy through the stories of our conservation heroes. Again, we want to thank our sponsors of this event. Our double platinum level sponsors include Helen Johnson Leopold and Greg Leopold. The platinum sponsors include Trout Unlimited, the United States Forest Service and the Department of Agriculture and the David H. Smith Conservation Research Fellowship Program, otherwise known as Smith Fellows. Silver sponsors include the Aldo Leopold Foundation, Ice Age Trail Alliance, Joanne M. and Richard C. Hemp, Stephen Bourne, Madison Audubon, Friends of Wisconsin Ducks Unlimited, Tim and Linda Isley, Kathleen Falk and Peter Bach, the Columbia Marquette Chapter of Pheasants Forever Inc. in Wisconsin, and bronze level sponsors include Peter McKeever, Door County Land Trust, Todd Ames, Paul DeLong, Wisconsin Society for Ornithology, Brent Haglin, Tom and Mary John Haugie, Wisconsin Wildlife Federation, and the American Society, the Society of American Foresters. In-kind contributions are from the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point. As you type in your thoughts in, uh, into the chat, there's a special message we received at our office and I'd like to read it now. And that message comes from James Addis or Jim Addis. He says, Mike, I have always been impressed with your ability to work with and lead people. Your scientific proficiency and skill allowed you to excel in every assignment that you took on. I suspect that your years of guiding musky fishermen contributed significantly to your long-term success. Congratulations on your well-deserved induction into the Wisconsin Conservation Hall of Fame. Again, from Jim Addis. And yes, Jim, I think most of us would agree after hearing the ceremony today that uh, Mike's time guiding other musky fisher men and fisher women contributed significantly to his long-term success. So as we conclude the ceremony, the video tribute to our conservation champion, Michael Dombeck, will now be played twice. We thank you so much for joining us today.